So Alex, I'm going to want you to go ahead and put the sound on for the PC. I'll launch that in just a moment. Um, you've heard me say, and I will say it again, over and over, one of my joys as a pastor is to get to know you and your stories. Um, I got to know Phil Soliday some over the past couple years. Uh, he's regular in our Saturday evening service and plays the piano for us there. Um, he also plays guitar, loves Spanish, works at the Ark. Um, this week I sat down with him and heard a little bit more of his story and recorded it on video. And when I was done, I realized it really fit with some of the themes of today. So I want to make certain I play it before we go into the message. Do you have the, the, the sound on for that? PC channel. Starting around uh, late elementary school, early middle school, I went through some difficult times in my life that uh, unfortunately gradually got worse all over time. But, uh, but one, one day after, uh, Sometime after my graduation from high school, tal vez en el punto más bajo de mi vida, tenía un mejor amigo quien, uh, quien, me, quien me invitó a, la igle a una iglesia bautista. At the time, I had some familiar familiarity with the religion, with God, with the familiar Bible stories, but what? But I, uh, but until. Uh, 2009 until that one service that I was invited to, I was I was missing more than uh, uh, I was missing more than uh, what uh, well what I actually needed from uh, from going to church and uh, and knowing and knowing about God and uh, and many of the traditions at the time. I don't remember a whole lot about the message that I sat through. It, that I sat through on that Easter Sunday. It was April 12, 2009. But after the service, there was well, what they call an invitation, which is an invite to go up to the altar to pray or to otherwise respond to the preaching. Or in my case, it was an opportunity to learn more about God and, uh, and more specifically to learn how I can know for sure that I'm on my way to heaven. When I die, there, como conocer el Señor Jesucristo como mi uh, Salvador personal. I uh, prayed and asked God to save my soul, to uh, to forgive me of the sins that I committed, past, present, and uh, future sins. And most importantly, I put my trust completely in uh, Jesus Christ to save my soul. No amount of good works on my part could uh, get me to heaven. No amount of good works, such as uh, praying or reading the Bible or giving money through the offering plates or uh, being a good son to my parents, none of that was going to get me to heaven. What was going to get me to heaven was my complete trust in Jesus Christ. And since then, things haven't been perfect, but but I consider uh, my situation to be blessed. And that God may not always work in uh, ways that we expect Him to, but uh, but often uh, when we uh, least expect it, or when we don't even realize that at the time. God can work and is still working today. Maybe not in the dramatic, uh, in the forms of dramatic miracles like parting the Red Sea or uh, helping uh, shepherd boy David uh, kill Goliath with uh, with a stone. But uh, but the Lord is still powerful, and if we would go to Him with a pure heart and a clean mind and uh, in a clean conscience, uh, you can work with that. Thank you. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the way you work in our lives. We thank you for Philip's story. 
And we pray that you'll just open us up to every gift you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll be getting back to Philip's story after we go through a few other pieces. Um, one of the most common pieces of junk mail I get on the outside, it says, you've been pre-approved. Yeah, you know, you get that junk mail too. You know what's on the inside, right? Free money. Yeah, yeah free money. Absolutely free. <laughs> you sign here and you can be the proud owner of. What they're not telling you is that you're not the proud owner of anything but debt. Or I get these phone calls. Hello, this is Angela. I'm calling about your credit card account. Well, which credit card? Well, you know, your credit card account. They don't know anything about my credit card account. They're not, it's not their business to know anything about my credit card account. They just want me to be in debt to them. Fortunately, I'm not in debt to any of them. Praise the Lord. But I get constant invitations to be in debt to somebody or to trade in my balance here for the bank and so I can pay, pay interest to them. Debt's a big deal in our culture. And Paul uses the language of debt in this text. He starts out by telling us, we don't owe the flesh anything. We are not debtors to the flesh. Because why? Verse 7, right before our reading text, says the flesh is hostile to God. Now, part of that hostility, the easy thing to say is, well, that's our destructive urges. We've got a few. There's another side to it that we usually don't pay attention to, and that is our own good works. And... Those works that come from our willpower as good people. And even to say, good Christian people. You know? Bonnie, she's a good Christian person. That's a compliment when we say that. But good works that come out of our willpower accomplish nothing for us except to create the illusion that we don't need God or that our need for God is limited. You know? I only needed God to get me one-third of the way to heaven because I'd already gotten myself two-thirds of the way there. Thank you very much. Which is much better than Kim, who only got herself halfway there. <laughs> she really needed God. So, Paul starts out and he says, we are debtors not to the flesh. And one of the things he's telling us is that this illusion of our goodness only serves to put us in debt to our own selves, to a selfish perception of our superiority, our independence from other lesser mortals, and even from God. The debt to the flesh separates us from everyone else and separates us from God. But it doesn't seem to do that. It's shiny. It comes with a brand new chip installed. It can be gold or platinum. Membership has its privileges. What's in your wallet? Sign here. Only later do we realize that we are in way over our head to what Paul calls a spirit of slavery that rules through fear. We are debtors not to the flesh, he says, but instead we're debtors to the Spirit of God. Oh no, that sounds awful too, because well, I don't want to be in debt. I mean, but no. One of the things that Paul tells us about this debt is it's not the kind of debt that just gets us into a deeper and deeper hole. The kind of debt we have to God is a debt that we owe to someone who has laid down life or limb for us, like countless servicemen and women who did so for our freedom. Or the debt we owe to Jesus, who died for something much greater, our salvation and the salvation of the world. In the language of the text, this debt we owe is a debt we owe to a loving Father, a debt that can never be repaid and is not designed to be repaid. Young ladies, I just want you to know, there is no way you can repay the debt you owe to your moms for changing your diapers. For driving you to practices and whether it's music or sports there's no way you can pay that back and in fact you're not supposed to and they're not supposed to hold it over your head it's not supposed to work like that the debt we owe to the Spirit of God is the kind of debt that is one that comes with a different message it says you've been pre-approved on the front yes but when you open it and look inside, it says, 
I already chose to love you. I already chose to forgive you. I already chose you to be my child and there's nothing you can do about it. God has chosen you. God has chosen me. We're only invited to say yes. Paul uses the language of adoption for that choosing process in this text. Um, in John's gospel, we have the language of new birth, which is bio child. Here we have adoption child. As many of you know, in my family growing up, we had both. I was the bio child. My parents looked at me. They said, he's just perfect. They called me JP. And they said, we don't need to have any more kids. After I got a little bit older, they decided, hmm, we do need to have some more kids. And so one of the things I, I, I tell to my adopted brother and sisters is, you're the chosen ones. I'm the accident. <laughs> because, of course, you've got to find humorous ways to deal with uh, sibling issues in any family and also in families where you've got the adoption and bio-child mix. The climax of this passage is in verses 15 to 17. When we cry, Abba, Father. Abba is the old Aramaic word for the intimate way a child, a, an, a baby would learn to call out to their father. You can say it just like we say Papa and you don't need teeth. Abba, Papa. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. You hear that word, God's heirs. That means God's written us into God's will. Last will and testament. Your name is in there, Sally. Your name is in there, Jim. Your name is in there, Eric. So that when God dies, guess what? You get it all. Newsflash. God in Christ died for us so we could get it all. This is Trinity Sunday, and we have in the few lines of this single sentence, Abba, Father, the Spirit bearing witness and being heirs with Christ. Father, Spirit, Son. I feel like Robin in the old Batman and Robin TV series. Holy Trinity, Batman! God has done it again. God has done it again. And here we get back to some of the themes in Philip's testimony, his own personal story. What you notice one of the things he says is he understood his salvation was not by works. He, you know, was not by prayer or reading the Bible or giving to the church or being the best son a mom could ever have. His mom is sitting right here right now. Chris. That doesn't get him there. It's only Jesus Christ and putting his trust in Jesus Christ. He talks as well about having confidence that he is God. That is, knowing that he's going to heaven. Knowing that Jesus is his personal Savior. And the language for that in this text is where Paul writes, it is the Spirit bearing witness to our spirits. That's similar to the themes we had last week in John chapter 15 and 16 where Jesus says the Spirit will testify and to the themes we had the week before in 1 John chapter 5. There are three that testify, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. Holy Trinity. God has done it again. One of the other things that Philip says is on that day, April 12th, 2009 and Easter Sunday he came to that church service he didn't remember the message there were other connections that were primary but he says he came to that church service with a legacy of some understanding he already had from going to church as a kid and as a young person he knew Bible stories he knew the rhythms of worship and praise and prayer and yet there was something that he was missing it's not an uncommon story. People say, I was going to church all my life, and I, I never heard that before. It's not because it wasn't said. It's not because the scripture wasn't read. It's not because there was no proclamation. It's because some things just don't click until they do. And on that day, it clicked for Philip. Maybe today is the day it clicks for you. 
where you realize that today's the day you can have confidence in God, where the Spirit bears witness with your spirit that you are a child of God, that your future is with God in heaven, that Jesus is your personal Savior, and that that life can begin here and now. Uh, the hymn we'll be singing, Live Tomorrow's Life Today, as the line repeats. But we struggle with this promise. We struggle with the, the possibility that we can be sure and confident that we are God's. We struggle with what Paul calls in this passage a spirit of slavery that causes us to fall back into fear. I remember sitting in a Bible study circle with a group of folks years ago, and we were reading that passage in 1 John where it says, if we confess our sins, God is faithful, God is reliable and just to forgive us our sins. And this one woman in the group said, not my sin. But it says right here in the scripture, but not my sin. My sin is so exceptional. My sin is so bad. My sin is so out of bounds that God can't forgive it. She was limiting the power and the grace of God because her sin was so exceptional. She didn't say all those words. She just said, not me. I cannot be forgiven. And she was really overcome by guilt that she had carried for years. We struggle with the promise of God that we are God's children, forgiven and loved. We struggle to receive that in all different ways in our lives. For me, one of my main struggles in that area I was 11 years old. Many of you know I've got just a little bit of anxiety in my life. Um, you combine that with some interesting religious expressions. Uh, when I was 11, I was struggling. Now, when I was nine was when I kind of came to faith. I don't have a specific date like Philip did. But when I was nine, I was struggling with anxiety around that. Did I really mean it when I prayed? I better pray again because it all depends on my prayer. If I don't pray it right or if I don't pray it and mean it seriously enough, maybe it didn't happen, which is really kind of confusing and ridiculous, but that's where I was at at that moment. I'm in the shower and I dissolve into tears because I'm sure that when I get out of the shower, my family will have been raptured and I would have been left behind. That's where you got kind of the, a little extra anxiety and religious experience going on. That wasn't exactly helpful. My mom gave me some of the best advice she ever, she ever gave me. She said, JP, you know, sometimes people, if they have something written down, it seems more firm. So why don't you write it down? And so I did. I wrote down my prayer, and I put it in a homemade envelope that I taped together, and you can see the tape is kind of worn off and marked the paper and doesn't really hold anything together now. And if you want to take a look at this afterwards, you can. And I wrote this to Jesus. November 30th, 1979. Dear Jesus, thank you for loving me and dying for me. This is so much that I cannot repay you, so please turn the page and you'll see my little offering to you. And I enumerated them. One, my life. Two, my spirit, my soul, my mind, my talents, my possessions, my body. I offer unto you, and these are all yours now, please help me not to take them back, Jesus. Happy birthday every Christmas. Then at the bottom of the page it says more and an arrow. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to you. Love, JP. I keep it in my sock drawer. The outside says it's sealed, but obviously the seal of the paper has not, not retained its integrity. That was me discovering that I could be confident that I was God's beloved. Blaise Pascal encountered Jesus on November 23rd, 1654, and he wrote about it in what is known as his memorial. Certainty, certainty, heartfelt joy, peace. I love the whole text of that memorial. That's just a line that stands out to me for the certainty that we can have that we are God's beloved children. Charles Wesley, one of the founding figures of the Methodist movement, along with his brother John, our great hymn writer, the hymn that he wrote on the anniversary of his conversion, and I'm sorry, I don't remember the date, but it's in the 1700s. 
the one year anniversary of his conversion is the first hymn in our hymnal and the first hymn in almost every Methodist hymnal around the world. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. And one of the verses he writes about this gift of certainty. In Christ your head you then shall know, shall feel your sins forgiven. To know and to feel that, that confidence. Anticipate your heaven below and own that love is heaven. Lord, we thank you. For the Holy Trinity. For the Father, whom we call Abba, and who loves us and adopts us. For the Spirit who witnesses with our spirit. And for Christ Jesus, who makes us an heir of God. We pray that you'll help us to say yes to that gift, to live tomorrow's life today. In Jesus' name, amen. Joan is gonna play the hymn through for us once because I believe it's new for most of us.